Challenger. Welcome viewer. This is the second video in the series where I debunk a bunch of flat earth proof from the channel Is Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? So let's jump into it. Flat Earth Proof 4 The Horizon No matter where you go in our vast Earth, the horizon will always appear as a perfectly level line. Well, it only took me 21 minutes last time to explain why this is the case. That video is titled Flat Earthers Claim Horizon is Always Eye Level. A short summary would be, it just is, and comes down to perspective. Imagine a brick wall. Rows of brick are usually parallel to the ground. The lines of the brick that are below your eye level will be angled upwards. The ones at your eye level will be straight across and the ones above your eye level will be angled downwards towards the eye level. You will also notice the farther the line goes, it seems to get closer and closer. Now crouch down, so another line of bricks becomes straight across your eye level. Guess what? The lines below your eye level are still angled upwards, and the ones above are still angled downwards, and they all still seem to converge. On a small wall, you will be able to visually spot that the line is not at the same height. And often you'd know that by using a background object as a reference point. But the longer the wall gets, the less prominent it becomes. You can now imagine a wall long enough where the convergence or vanishing point would appear to be the same spot even when you're crouching or standing up. That is what basically happens with Horizon. Flat Earth Proof 5 Solar Rays it's not uncommon to see sun's rays shining through the clouds at diverging angles, but after tracing these rays back to their source, it becomes apparent that the sun is not millions of miles away. My previous video explaining crepuscular sun rays was relatively short, and to be honest, wasn't much debunking. Quick primer. Crepuscular sun rays, commonly known as god ray, happens when sunlight passes through the air, hitting bigger particles like dust and water, which bounces all the colors pretty much the same. Thus, most of the God's ray looks white. Apart from the dust and water particles, we also need something to block the sunlight to be able to see the paths of individual rays. Without that, light would just be bouncing off everything equally. Cloud just happens to be denser pockets of water vapors and dust that are great at blocking sun. But you can get trees and other structure blocking the sun in a similar way. Usually areas around cloud tends to have some dust and water. And when sunlight manages to break through the cloud, well, it would hit a bunch of stuff to have it scattered. Voila, glorious God's ray. If you manage to view it when the sun is at the horizon, well, you will get to see God's ray that stretches all the way across the sky. It would seem that they are being radiated from the sun and the rays going behind you, directly opposite the sun, is where they all seem to meet, as if they were being radiated out from some invisible sun. The rays that are going behind you is called anticrepuscular rays. Understanding how crepuscular rays work would surely mean one should understand that if we create a cone, we are really getting the height of the diffuser or blocker, and that definitely doesn't fit with anticrepuscular rays. Obviously, if we view the ray outside the Earth's atmosphere, it would look parallel. On screen, you can see a picture that was taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station providing an unusual viewing perspective from above the God's ray being parallel. Further demonstrating that the distance traveled by sunlight is not in the millions of miles is the fact that if the heat of the sun were indeed traversing the 93 million miles as claimed by modern science, 
then the stark difference in the sun's ability to heat the tropics versus the polar regions of this alleged relative speck shouldn't even exist, as the distance to the polar regions from the equator is just a mere 0.00004% further, or just one twenty-five thousandth of the distance. This I haven't handled before. It is a very fair question. And by not talking about the main variable, this sounds extremely valid. Why indeed do we have icy poles? Well, one of the most common and persistent scientific misconceptions is that our seasons are caused by our distance from the sun. And this is what the video is getting to. So polar region, there are contributing factors and is the result of a wonderful self-reinforcing process. This is truly amazing. Let's start with tropospheric length. This is the length a beam of solar radiation must travel to make it from upper troposphere to the Earth's surface. The distance is minimized when the sun is directly overhead and is maximized when the sun is near the horizon. Where the rays intersect with the atmosphere at right angles, the light energy has a strength of 1361 watts per square meter where the solar radiation strikes the Earth's atmosphere at a much lower angle. As in the polar region, the incoming solar energy per unit of area is substantially reduced. The global average solar energy arriving at the upper margin of the atmosphere can be calculated at as approximately 340 watts per square meter. On top of this lower radiation, we have the angle of sun. The curvature of the Earth causes the Sun's energy to spread out over larger areas with increasing latitude. The greater the land area the energy spreads across, the lower the energy per unit area. When the Sun is near the horizon, solar radiation is spread over a larger area. We can see an example by noticing how shadows get longer as the Sun approaches horizon. This results in polar area having lower energy per unit area. With the low solar intensity, the Earth's surface cannot warm as rapidly. This brings us to the next variable. This word would be familiar to game designers, three modelers alike. Albedo. It is the ratio which the light reflected from an unpolished surface bears to the total light falling upon that surface. In modeling, we would crank up that value to make object reflective. When it comes to the reflective capacity of the Earth's surface, it is called albedo effect. How much of the incident solar radiation is reflected by the Earth's surface? As a basic rule of thumb, the darker or rougher a surface is, the less radiation it reflects. A freshly plowed field may reflect about 10% of the sun's energy. Green meadows and pastures can account for about 25%. Light-colored surfaces such as desert sand have an albedo of 40%. When it comes to snow and ice, well, freshly fallen snow will reflect up to 90% of the incident solar energy. Depending on its age and surface structure, sea ice can have an albedo of 50 to 70%. This rather large range is partially due to the deposition of dust and soot particles on the ice surface over time, which changes its color, particularly in the Arctic. So this is the loop. Both polar regions get a small amount of solar energy. A large proportion of the energy that does arrive is mostly reflected away. As a result, it is not stored as thermal energy in the ground or ocean and actually reinforces cooling. In turn, more sea ice is formed in response to the increasing cold, which in turn increases the total albedo levels. This then results in even more solar radiation being reflected. Climate researchers refer to such self-amplifying processes as positive feedback. There are some other factors like water vapor, jet stream and such, but I think we have a basic understanding now on why the poles are cold. Quick point. 
South Pole is much colder than the North Pole as it sits on top of a very thick ice sheet, which itself sits on a continent. The surface of the ice sheet at the South Pole is more than 9,000 feet in elevation. In comparison, the North Pole rests in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, where the surface of floating ice rides only a foot or so above the surrounding sea. The Arctic Ocean also acts as an effective heat reservoir, warming the cold atmosphere in the winter and drawing heat from the atmosphere in the summer. Done. Their next video is titled Flat Earth Proof 6 Polar Climates. Now I'm glad that I covered the polar partially. Flat Earth Proof 6 Polar Climates If Earth were a globe, then it should follow that both the Arctic and Antarctic regions would share similar conditions and characteristics. Can I be a bit silly just for a moment? To me, the difference between Chinese soup and gravy is one is liquid with some solid chunks and the other is just some liquid with major solid chunks. They both fit in a bowl and microwaved. Is there a good enough reason to say that they share similar condition and characteristic? Arctic is the soup. It is an ocean surrounded by land, where, as Antarctic, is my gravy. A land surrounded by ocean. Believe it or not, it makes all the difference. We touched on it briefly earlier when we talked about why South Pole is much, much colder than North Pole. For instance, the longest days in the North are much longer than those in the South. Dawn and dusk also occur differently in these two regions, with twilight coming and lasting much longer in the North, sometimes for over an hour compared to similar southern latitudes where twilight always comes and goes quickly, sometimes in a matter of minutes. First, let's address the different day length. No, both pole receives equal amount of light. Now, we are talking about the absolute pole here. Why that is important? Well, if we look at a site like timeanddate.com, we get a beautiful south pole value. Do a search on North Pole. Quite often, you will be shown value from Alaska Post, which is at 64.751. The farthest land point I could click was Cap Hans Egede, which is at 83.613, where the South Pole data is from 90 degrees south. This means if you compare day-night cycle from Cap Hans or from Alaska, it would be different than South Pole. For the claim that day lengths are different, well, I can't find any values for 90 degree north, so here is my very unscientific test. At timeanddate.com, I chose a position to the same longitude but opposite latitude to Cap Hans Egede, which is at 83 degree 36 minutes 46.8 seconds north and 35 degree 8 minutes 24 seconds west. So this position has the same west, but is in south. Note that I'm not expecting these values to be absolute precise. On screen, you can see that I'm overlaying the south values on top of north values and note how the curves match up. If we compare with absolute north pole values, this is what we would see. So I guess we can say different day length and dusk dawn behaving differently is pretty much busted, right? Well, so is twilight. But let's talk about that. Simply put, twilight on Earth is the illumination of the lower atmosphere when the sun is not directly visible because it is below the horizon. Twilight is produced by sunlight scattering in the upper atmosphere, illuminating the lower atmosphere so the Earth's surface is neither completely lit nor completely dark. The lower the sun is beneath the horizon, the dimmer the twilight. Other factors such as atmospheric conditions being equal. When the sun reaches 18 degrees below the horizon, the twilight's brightness is nearly zero, and evening twilight becomes nighttime. When the sun again reaches 18 degrees below the horizon, nighttime becomes morning twilight. 
When it is less or equal to 6 degree below the horizon, we call it civil twilight, with when enough natural light remains that artificial light is not needed. When it is between 12 degree and 6 degree, we call it nautical twilight. At nautical dawn and nautical dusk, the human eye finds it difficult, if not impossible, to discern traces of illumination near the sunset or sunrise point of the horizon. Finally, between 18 degree and 12 degree, it is astronomical twilight. So when we hear poles having 6 months of day and 6 months of night, that is only true if we completely ignore this thing called twilight. In Arctic and Antarctic latitudes in winter time, the polar night only rarely produces complete darkness for 24 hours each day. This can occur only at locations within 5.5 degrees of latitude of the pole, and there only on dates closer to the winter solstice. At all other latitude or dates, the polar night includes a daily period of twilight. The duration of twilight depends on the latitude and the time of the year. So let's look at some polar twilight. This occurs in areas that are located at the inner border of the polar circles, where the sun will be on or below the horizon all day on the winter solstice. It lies at latitude between 67 degree 24 minutes and 72 degree 34 minutes north or south. Let's pick something at 72 parallel line. In south, we have Queen Maud land claimed by Norway. In north, we find Novaya Zemla, Uzuni Island, Russia. I'll tabulate first of every month, so we will have 12 data values of civil twilight. And that is sum of both morning and evening twilight for each place. Now remember what that video said. In similar latitude, twilight lasts much longer in north, often over hours, where in south it lasts only minutes. On screen you can see the tabulated data. You're obviously more than welcome to double check those numbers. You can see the coordinates and all dates are on first of each month. On our earlier example, I located a position on the same longitude. Over here, both are on different longitude with over 51 degree difference. That is to say that please don't expect the values to match up with each other. Well, the lowest value I can see for north is 56 minutes, while the lowest in south is 1 hour 48 minutes. I'm just kidding, I'm not comparing those two. Unless the video is looking at the very same time, like me saying, it lasts for 56 minutes in 72 north, but nothing in 72 south. Yes, technically that is what is expected due to the curve. I hope this is enough to prove that statements regarding day length, dusk dawn and twilight time is also false. Moving on. Next part is about midnight sun. So yes. Every year during summer solstice, the sun does not set below the horizon within a 24-hour period. Although approximately defined by the polar circles, in practice the midnight sun can be seen as much as 90 km outside the polar circle. Because there are no permanent human settlements south of Antarctic Circle, apart from research stations, the countries and territories whose population experience the midnight sun are limited to those crossed by Arctic Circle, like Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and such. Then this video will bitch about 1. How there is no uncut video. I'm not sure what they mean by uncut. Are we talking about non-time lapsed? So in one of the most inhospitable place in the earth, they want someone to take a rolling footage for say at least 15 days with enough storage and power for the camera? They don't want much, do they? But it wouldn't matter even if such footage exists. I found several time-lapse videos of Antarctica, 15 days of midnight sun footage, because then the video follows up with there are no independent explorers and the wife's tale of how no one is allowed to visit the place. What a bunch of bull. You can go and visit Antarctica. And for a two-person expedition, 
be prepared to pay around $100,000. And uncut? Damn! Even if you swap the battery while having another camera running, that would still not be uncut. And what is independent anyway? Further demonstrating that the central northern regions receive a more benevolent climate than their southern counterparts, Iceland thrives with 870 native plant species and abundant animal life. Well, to be honest, I suck in botany and had never been interested in animal migration pattern. But there are some obvious facts I would like to mention. The average temperature in North Pole during summer is 0 degrees Celsius, which drops down to minus 40 in winter, whereas South Pole has a summer of minus 28.2 degree and a winter of minus 60 degree. Very few things can survive in that harsh climate. If you haven't seen March of the Penguin, it is a good watch and gives us a glimpse of how ferocious that place can be. For one of my mentalism effect, I like to misquote from the TV series Dexter. A Dutch farmer sees his crop fail. No money to his name. He takes a job working on a boat. An unseasonably strong wind blows him to Indonesia. He drops a bean into the soil and voila, 400 years later, Java. I don't know if the Java story is true or not. But we did have a hand shaping what we see around. From domestication of dogs to bananas, we humans have introduced species and plants to different parts of the world. Oh, and did I mention germs? Then there are some species. Take for example, Royal Bengal Tiger. It is an endangered species of tiger with very distinct stripe and is only found in Sundarbon a forest-spanning part of Bangladesh and India. I'm mentioning this just due to the fact that Sundarbon is part of the subcontinent, and yet this tiger is not found in other parts. Do I know why? Nope, I'm just stating a fact. So asking why a place has less native plants than another is a valid question. There are many variables, but personally, I don't think this avenue would help anyone Prove the globe is a lie. But to crown it all off, despite the Arctic regions enjoying moderately warm summers and manageable winters, where the average annual temperature is minus 15 degrees Celsius, Antarctica is by far the coldest place on Earth, with an average annual temperature of minus 50 degrees Celsius. We have touched on this earlier. It's the damn Arctic Ocean acting as an effective heat reservoir, warming the cold atmosphere in the winter and drawing heat from the atmosphere in the summer. Why does it feel like flat earthers like to compare apples with oranges? Well, that would be all for this video. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this content so far, please drop a like and comment and maybe even subscribe to know of my latest uploads debunking the rest. That would be greatly appreciated and would help my small channel grow. Have a safe day. Signing off.